Yeah, but going back then, let's talk about aspergine, so the, what I call the original targeted yeah, and trying to do it. What's the difference between pegylating and Irwinia? And, and, and okay. Well, it's a little bit historical. Uh, Aspargin could be the, a very good targeted treatment. It's, it's targeted treatment without myelosuppression, in fact, as other side effects. So it, it's an enzyme. Uh, uh, historically, it was produced from E. coli bacteria. Uh, but now, so it's called a e na native uh, uh, asparaginase. It's a very short-acting drug. There's even a shorter active drug which is made from Ervinia bacteria that is uh, good for patients who develop hypersensitivity to the E. coli. Remember, it's, it's a protein, it's a, so you can develop hypersensitivity. Now, uh, E. coli is no longer available in this country. It's available in Canada and, and in Europe. But even there, I think people are switching to the third type, which is the pegylated asparaginase. And this is uh, polyethylene glycol combined with the, the same E. coli asparaginase. It's an E. coli asparaginase, but the, the pegylation gives it two, uh, one, clear, one advantage and the second one's possible advantage. One is that it, it's a half-life is, is about seven days. So we actually studied the pharmacokinetics in it. Uh, everybody has uh, activity for 14 days, and a lot of uh, people, or half of them, will have it for four weeks. It's a very, very long-acting drug, so there is maybe a, also a more activity. The second thing, the pegylation probably protects the, the, the immune system from developing an, uh, uh, allergies, and not only clinical allergies, but what we call silent hypersensitivity, where you develop antibodies to the drug, and, uh, but you don't have a clini the clinical allergy. And uh, we just have an abstract we've presented in this ash that is actually not so high with the pegylated asparaginase. So, so this is about uh, the drug. The problem with the drug is it's got totally different side effects than, uh, than any other chemotherapy. It's not myelosuppressive, uh, it's allergies, pancreatitis, but really in adults, uh, and it's not so much in children, and I think that l might limit its use, is the pegylated as asparaginase has got liver toxicity, 30% uh, of the patients. Uh, we had an APSAC in ACTS 2013 showing that everybody recovers from, but it's most common after the first cycle and you can get a delay in your next cycle because of the hyperbilirubin. It's about 30% of uh, the patient have it. So are you making adjustments? Are you, are you recommending? So, th so the first thing we have done, and this is uh, the paper that, you, uh, uh, that we published this year, uh, we actually dose it based on its pharmacokinetic uh, uh, properties. So, for example, uh, we separate the myelos in induction, the myelos suppression of the downloadubicin, and only given at the first three days, and asparaginase is given later. So we don't have an interaction between, let's say, myelos suppression. In fact, they recover the white cells in induction at day 18, or the platelets, and the pegylated asparagine is given in day 16, so you don't have, let's say, pancreatitis or liver problems and, and sepsis. The second thing we reduce, we think in adults, the FDA dose, 2,500, is too high. Uh, pharmacokinetics uh, show that you can use 2,000 and probably even less, especially if you start measuring enzymatic activity. So hold that thought. I'm going to ask Mark. So in, in the new ECOG study, you use it peg asparaginase. And, and then I know Nicola has got a paper here, an abstract here in the 2014 ASH in the older patient uh, using a much lower dose of asparaginase, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, uh, and the uh, intergroup trial that we're leading in the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, we are incorporating a BFM regimen, so we have a uh, pegasparaginase built into that, and we are using the 2,000 uh, uh, unit per meter squared dose, and actually capping at, at one vial, uh, but we're only giving up to patients up to the age of 55. Uh, there is definite uh, increase in, in toxicity in general as patients get older, Primar primarily uh, hyperbilirubinemia, somewhat uh, uh, thromboses. Uh, Dr. Gottbuget from the German group uh, has presented data at this meeting that asparaginase can be given in older individuals, but she's actually reduced the dose down as low as 500 uh, units per meter squared. Thank you. So there's other ways to reduce toxicity, as I say, using it pharmacokinetically. Since it's such a long-acting drug, some places are giving it every two weeks, and it's, you'll get 
you, there's a very high risk of getting overlapping toxicities if it's such a low. So we never give it less than four weeks. In fact, we sometimes give it uh, in intervals that vary. So there's no sustained activity. We have prolonged but not sustained so, activity. So one of the interesting thoughts I had when I heard you talk uh, and discussing this with Adele Fielding from the UK and about MRC, it's about what you can combine it with. And I think there's a rational, you've, you've proposed a rational approach of how you can combine asparaginase with other chemotherapy. Yeah, and there's another one, and I hmm. think that will be a problem of the 1043, is they took one arm of the pediatric approaches, and that there was a, another arm that was high dose metotrexate with pegylated asparagine. It turned out that the other arm was, was better. So you have to... Uh, it, it, but let me just state, but in the younger patient population, but not, there is, not many in the adolescent young adult. But there is a, a theoretical reason right. that if, if asparaginase blocked the activity of metotrexate. So in the, in the 1043, you give pegylated asparaginase, then you give every other day, you give metotrexate at escalating doses or, or at shorter intervals. So it works well with E. coli, it's very short acting, but you give the pegylated. It blocks all the... So in our approach, we give the pegylate asparaginase only after the second dose. We have two, two doses in a cycle, only after the second dose, because we know it will block it if we get it earlier. So that's another uh, interaction. There's a lot of things to consider, but there is one thing I, I think maybe to make it... People are not sure what, why... Is there a role? I mean, why is it so critical? Why are we discussing it? So in my opinion, it's, it's a... It's a very critical drug. It's used in every pediatric protocol. Every pediatric randomized trial, which asparaginase was the factor that was studied, not anything else, showed a better outcome if it was given at longer duration, mostly longer duration uh, than shorter uh, duration. There's a dose response effect. It's clear. I mean, even the Germans have shown it's better 2,000 than 1,000, but then you have to look at the toxicity. So, so here in 2014, we have the availability of enzyme assays. Should we be measuring the asparaginase levels yeah, and so determining whether there's truly a hi silent hypersensitivity? In yeah, so that's a, a big question. We, it's one of the discussions we had here. Uh, we found it's not a high rate, and we found it's 60 Six percent. It's a small study, preliminary data, but it didn't show that everybody has neutralizing antibodies. So there's two issues here of measuring. One, measuring the drug so you don't get levels of toxicity. It's nothing to do with antibodies. And that needs to be studied, I think. I mean, we're giving 2,000, but we know there's a variability in activity in patients. The second question, do we need to check uh, neutralizing antibodies? Because it blocks the activity. And if you get it blocked at the second cycle, your next four cycles you're giving toxicity, but no benefit. And the question comes, should we measure antibodies? Not only antibodies, because there are, a lot of them are non-neutralizing. Should we check antibodies after every cycle? So the issue of the pharmacokinetic and me and measurement will become important, I think, needs to be studied and then might be introduced into our standard clinical practice. Well, thank you. And there's, there's one, there was one study where they showed if you have more than 80% of PEC asparagine delivered, patients did better. So which brings it back to the point, it's, it's the delivery, you have to deliver it, and that's limited by the side effects sometimes. But also then obviously you're dealing with the, you know, insufficient inhibition of the, of the enzyme itself, so. There's one more point I want to make about the liver toxicity, because I think that limits its use, and I'm afraid the 1043 will be, will, people will not use it so much because of liver toxicity. It's about 25%. Well, we have found that if you give it again, you don't necessarily get the same toxicity. There's something that, uh, it's mostly in the first cycle, but then you give it next cycles, uh, half of them don't get it, and only half get it. So the main, there's something strange about it that uh, you don't, so you, what we do, what we did in the study that we published, we continued giving the drug despite the prior grade 3 toxicity, and we didn't see that. We didn't stop the drug because the only reason to stop the drug is pancreatitis, and then switch to Irvinia between hypersensitivity. We don't even stop it for clotting because you can use now uh, high molecular weight. And so the issue of, of liver toxicity, and, and it is, it's great three or four, and it takes the time, could be a, a, a problem. But 
it should, I think you should continue using it. And I think people will get their own experience uh, to learn it because I think this will be difficult. Well, thank you. Now